Okay, so we're very happy to have Thomas Ferguson from uh, uh, Amsterdam and St. Andrews uh, via Hawaii um, here to talk about relevant arithmetic at our first meeting of, uh, or first meeting after a little while of MOPA. Thanks, Thomas. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, okay, so yeah, thank you very much for having me out. And um, I, I used to attend these when I was in New York religiously, and um, it was Really, going to the MOPA seminars is always one of the high points of, of my week. So I'm, I'm really happy to be talking with you all. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, something that is pretty heterodox, but I don't think it is. Uh, I, think it's, I think it's an important uh, research program um, that I've been trying to uh, bring to the eyes of more people. Um, it's heterodox in the sense that it's, it resists uh, some of the consequences of, of Girdle's incompleteness theorems, and it tries to provide a different foundation for arithmetic and for mathematics more broadly. Um, why it still, I think, makes sense is that, so when I say something like that in Meyer, I, I don't want to talk about the work of Bob Meyer, when Meyer acknowledges this, uh, when somebody says I'm going to resist, you know, some element of the inc incompleteness theorems, I mean, I think we've all been trained by experience, right, to have a little alarm bell going on in our heads. Um, right? We have terms like canter crank that are out there, you know, for people that, you know, send in a 400 page of proof about why diagonalization is not a valid proof method and such, right? Uh, this is, I think, a very well thought out, if ultimately it took a very, ultimately, maybe, maybe, I don't want to say unsuccessful prematurely, but Meyer, I think, viewed it as unsuccessful. It's an ultimately unsuccessful program. It's, I think, a very philosophically plausible, very subtle uh, approach to arithmetic that uh, I think deserves appreciation. Um, so what I'm going to talk about then is uh, the following items. I'm going to introduce relevant arithmetic that Bob Meyer called R uh, sharp. Um, I'm going to discuss some of the promising items about um, uh, R sharp, right? Uh, about piano arithmetic formulated in relevant logic and why it seemed very promising in the 70s and 80s and up to the early 90s. And then I'm gonna discuss a result that was due to Harvey Friedman uh, that uh, he and Meyer jointly published that essentially sounded the death knell to Meyer's program of relevant arithmetic. Um, it certainly stopped Meyer from earnestly developing the program any further. Um, but I, I, I want to conclude by talking about some of the, and reflecting on whether or not the death knell was indeed sounded over it. So um, part of, you know, part of this uh, is coming out of Graham who's present and I just co-edited um, a collection in the Australian Journal of Logic, a special issue on, on Meyer's program of relevant arithmetic. I'm going to give you a shameless plug at the end for it. Um, but uh, it collects a, a number of papers that are original papers in, in, you know, by current researchers on you know, the current, the continuing interest and, and plausibility of this program. So I don't think it's dead in any way. And I want to provide some reasons that I think you might think that it's interesting as well. Um, Okay, so uh, Bob Meyer was, uh, I, I, he's an American that spent most of his career in Australia, um, was a logician that worked in non-classical logics primarily. So I, one analogy I wanna draw because talking about a non-classical logic like relevant logics um, and arithmetic formulated therein, I think that as, as typically classical mathematicians, you've at least been exposed to something that's analogous in Heising arithmetic, right? So we're aware of intuitionistic logic generally, right? Where we take some of the assumptions of classical, you know, proof theory or you know, natural deduction calculus or whatever, and one says, you know, these don't always get the right results on this uh, for this, you know, reason, right? In in the case of intuitionists, right? You know, we need to avoid the ex lot of excluded middle, right? Because if you reason about an infinite domain, according to Brouwer, uh, with excluded middle, 
assuming that essentially assumes that we have a solution, right? A proof of refutation for any mathematical problem, right? So Brouwer resists that because he's thinking about truth as a sort of mental construction. Um, and then, you know, we induce Heising arithmetic by uh, evaluating piano, the piano axioms uh, on the basis of intuitionistic logic. So the situation is very, very similar in, in this case, right? We have a, uh, a class, a family of deductive systems, relevant logics, and I'll explain the sense in which they are so-called relevant in a moment. And in the same way that, you know, as, as logicians, right, what you and I do uh, when we're doing, you know, piano arithmetic is we're, we're looking at the theory on, of the piano axioms closed under a particular, uh, you know, deduction system, namely classical logic. We just do the same analogous move. We look at the piano axioms with which we don't take any issue, and we close that under a slightly weaker deductive system. Um, so to provide, and I, this is, you know, you don't need to go through this. This is for completeness. I put this up here. Um, you know, we can axiomatize, and this is a Hilbert style presentation of a uh, calculus that is, that is weaker right, than classical uh, logic. So um, to give an understanding about what the, where the relevance is in relevant logic, um, one of the, uh, the, the relevance is, a, is in an intuitive sense, right, is a constraint that when we apply reasoning, we shouldn't start off from a set of premises and end up with a conclusion that is entirely irrelevant to those premises, right? So the uh, you know, observation about really, it's a psychological observation in some sense, I think, right? About human reasoning is that we tend to, uh, we tend to reason along a chain, right? Where we insist on having you know, we stay on the same topic, we stay on the same subject matter as we're reasoning. And sort of, you know, some of the classically valid inference principles have the appearance of pulling a rabbit out of a hat because we're pulling out subject matter that was not even on the table, modulo those hypotheses. So one of the uh, arguments, um, and I know that Graham's got a name for this that I can't recall, uh, uh, that we have for you know a relevantly invalid principle um, is is on the screen. So classically and you know intuitionistically, if you start off with a hypothesis of a uh, an in like a, of, a, of a of a contradiction, right? We can uh, infer therefrom uh, arbitrary conclusions, right? Uh, you know we and we you know so you know from from what is uh, you know, a contradiction, we can infer arbitrary conclusions. And you know, in a sort of natural deduction style, you can see the ingredients that go in to this type of argument, right? We can uh, you know, simplify, we can introduce double negation, and then we can ultimately apply this principle of disjunctive syllogism. So we, from one side, we have not, not A, from the other side, we have not A or B, and therefore, we can apply disjunctive syllogism to get B. Now, if one wants to, you know, it's his own relevance, there are different ways that you can go to, uh, to, to get this. So we have, you know, a collection of, you know, four different rules together give us an instance of irrelevance. Um, so what the typical relevant logician says is that disjunctive syllogism is, is the culprit. This is the this is the move that introduces that irrelevance into the inference. Other people, and I've worked on uh, uh, the work of uh, a logician named William Perry, you know, he, he rejected addition that from A, we can infer A or B arbitrarily. But the class of relevant logics that we're thinking of reject disjunctive syllogism as and identify this as the locus that provides us the irrelevance of this particular inference. So what is R sharp then? Uh, R sharp is just taking the piano axioms and this rule of induction and uh, infer, you know, enclosing these under relevant logic that we have right here and getting a theory of arithmetic on that basis. Um, 
So uh, why there are a number of reasons that uh, Meyer uses to uh, promote R sharp as being an appropriate formalization of arithmetic. And uh, you can break these up into very conservative ones. You can break them up into liberal ones. And the conservative reasons, and we'll talk about a little, uh, a couple of those, are pretty, you know, pretty, I think, straightforward. If R is supposed to be a good formalization of our intuitive reasoning, right? I mean, the claim is not that uh, we reason incorrectly when we reason in our day-to-day -day lives, right? The, the claim of the R logician is that we do reason collect correctly. It's just that classical logic doesn't actually capture it. It's not an adequate model of how we as reasoners actually operate, right? So on the conservative justification, R sharp more correctly, uh, uh, you know, gives us an account of what we're doing as mathematicians when we're thinking about arithmetic. It captures our informal reasoning about things. We reason about arithmetic informally, and therefore R sharp gives us a more, you know, clear picture of what we're actually up to. Um, there's other reasons, and we'll see another couple of those about how we can make some distinctions uh, in this language that we can't make in the, in the, in the classical case. R is able, allows us to make distinctions between uh, various types of entailment that we don't really have access to. So there's conservative reasons that like, it makes things interesting, it, it more adequately captures what we are doing when our behavior, when we're reasoning about mathematics. And then there are radical reasons that Meyer uh, suggests that we should take an interest in uh, R sharp, right? Um, Ultimately, what Meyer thinks or thought prior to the Friedman result was that we found in R sharp a way to essentially reinstate Hilbert's program uh, and avoid the consequences of Gödel's second incompleteness theorem. Um, so just to you know put up, I put up Rosser's version because I think it's a little bit nicer, right? Um, just to recall, you know, the first incompleteness theorem right, is that for any theory that is sufficiently rich and can express like Robinson arithmetic or contains Robinson arithmetic Q, um, then there is a sentence that is, if, if that theory is consistent, then there exists a sentence that is neither, oh shoot, I'm sorry, that is neither provable, there should be a neg negation sign in there, nor disprovable in that theory, right? So the first incompleteness theorem is that any sufficiently strong theory of, of, of Number theory is incomplete if it's consistent uh, in the sense that there are sentences that are neither provable nor refutable in that system. And the second incompleteness theorem, right, is that in, in any consistent theory that is capable of expressing number theory that uh, is adequate to number theory, then we can find a sentence that expresses its own consistency that is unprovable, right? Unprovable in, this, in the system. So no system that's sufficiently strong is capable of proving its own consistency. Um, so I, this is, there's you know, some subtlety here in how R sharp stands with respect to uh, Gödel's theorems. But I'm gonna give you Meyer's own point so I don't misrepresent them. All right, I've got a couple of quotes in this. I'm sorry, I'm gonna be doing a little bit of reading. But um, Meyer in his own words, right, in the manuscript, uh, the man monograph, Consistency of Arithmetic, tells us that the present paper offers no correction of Gödel's famous first theorem, right? To the contrary, we shall demonstrate as expected that R sharp and all of its consistent axiomatizable extensions are incomplete, right? So there is no issue with the first theorem, right? Um, nor do we offer a technical correction of the second theorem that there is a formula consistent of uh, piano arithmetic, which may be taken, P sharp is what Meyer uses to describe classical PA, which may be taken to express the consistency of PA, but which is unprovable in PA. That's not here in question, right? So, I mean, you can tell right off the bat that the relationship between Meyer's work and Gödel's theorems is at least not coarse, right? He's thinking about this, I think, pretty clearly. Um, uh, what, but, but to get clear about what he intends, right, is that what is offered, rather, is a philosophical correction. First, we correct the impression that piano arithmetic 
or anything like it is the system whose consistency needs to be proved in the first place, right? And this follows, according to Meyer, from the idea that R sharp more correctly describes, right, our behavior as mathematicians. Uh, second, we establish the consistency of the system, R sharp and related systems that may be more or less adequate to the needs of mathematics. Um, so what this is, uh, yeah, so what this is going to uh, follow from is an observation of Meyer that R sharp through finitary means can be proven to be consistent in an important sense, right? Uh, and we'll, we'll go through that, but the general shape of this argument right here is, is sort of twofold, right? Why R sharp avoids Gödel's incomplete, our second incompleteness theorem. On the one hand, right, piano arithmetic closed under classical logic um, doesn't, isn't, isn't the best proxy as a formalization of mathematical practice. And therefore, when we're considering uh, this consistency sentence and, and you know, we don't even need to consider that because PA is sort of a, I, I don't know what the right word would be, a cipher. It's, it's, not, it's not the right target to begin with. And secondly, we, we, although there is in fact this formal sentence that corresponds to consistency that we can prove or that we cannot prove in, in R sharp, there's an important way that we, with our own eyes and through finitary methods can see that it is in fact adequate, that we, namely that there are sentences like zero is equal to one that cannot be proven in R sharp. Um, okay, so two, two minor points that he makes before we're gonna dig in any further, right? That I think are important for the sequel. Um, on the one hand, right, he gives a description about why the vocabulary of R is, is sort of, up to the task, um, right? So he makes his observation where he writes that we may think of the classical truth functional vocabulary as well suited for the expression of facts about the natural numbers, but not as oriented at all towards the expression of the laws in virtue of which we discover the facts. So I'm sorry, let me, let me back up really quickly and make one observation about this that I, I don't wanna skip over too quickly. This right arrow symbol right here, Right, is taken as an intentional uh, conditional, right? It's not equivalent, A right arrow B is not equivalent to not A or B, right? So we, as, as you know, being trained in mathematical logic, we're familiar with defining the conditional as the material conditional, right? Which is just A implies B is the same as not A or B. This right arrow that we use in this axiomatization is more subtle than that. It can't just be defined or evaluated away uh, in terms of disjunction and negation. Now, importantly, right, that conditional that's equivalent, the material conditional is equivalent to not A or B. I mean, that's a, that's a member of the language that's express, you know, that expresses something. It's not as though we exclude that material conditional when we're thinking in that uh, way. Thomas, Thomas, can I can I ask at this point something? Please, uh, yeah. You know, because uh, I don't see a disjunction. Oh, so the disjunction appears only in R three. Is that right? Um. Yeah, Sorry. but we can also we can define it. Uh, the axiomatization here isn't oh. all that important, oh. but disjunction exists in the language. Yeah, and it's oh, and, and so how is it defined? Oh, through negation. I mean, disjunction can be defined um, as uh, you know through De Morgan's laws. I see. All right. Yeah. So conjunction and disjunction, those those operate as you expect. Negation really does uh, largely uh, behave as you expect. It's not. It doesn't have that intuitionistic flavor where there's you know this very uh, uh, novel interpretation of negation. It's it's essentially you know it turns you know truth into falsity and falsity into truth. Um, the, the change, and I really wish I had a modern PC where I could write something on the screen, but um, that is that this is not the material conditional. This can't be defined, that, that right arrow in virtue of other, in terms of other, other characters, right? So 
uh, this, I just wanted to make that qualifications because I think that maybe, you know, like we're trained to see an implication connective and think of it as not A or B, but it's, it's not. Um, so can I ask uh, if you can go back to the, the axioms for R sharp? Yeah. Um, right, so, so you are using this, this version of the conditional kind of like basically everywhere here. Yeah, uh, yeah. Now, it's important. I mean, we still have the truth of the ones with, that would be formulated with what I'm writing as a horseshoe. Right. Um, it's just that, yeah, we're formulating them in this sense. So the, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna point to something that Meyer writes about this distinction that hopefully should help motivate this. So just making sure that it's clear that there is in fact a distinction in term in meaning between these two. Um, I, I why there should be a difference and the importance of the, the difference. I think we can just straightforwardly look at Meyer to to give this right. Um, so what Meyer writes is that the material conditional right not A or B. I take to be a fact laden connective. He writes. It merely transmutes simpler statements of fact into a more complex statement of fact. As such, it neither rests on nor licenses any lawful connections between the facts so compounded. Um, but, right, you're right, good arguments rest on connections and not facts. So while it, if you have a, and we'll, we'll look at one of his examples, if you have a horseshoe B, this is, this is not empty according to Meyer, it doesn't, I mean, it communicates something important, but it expresses only that it happens to be the case that either A is false or B is true. It doesn't express any deeper connection between the two. It's rather an sort of accidental feature of these two things that they both happen to have this relationship. In contrast though, writes Meyer, the relevant right arrow, is introduced precisely to take account of these connections, the connections that we work with when we're doing mathematics, right? Importantly, again, R sharp is supposed to capture what we're really doing. And this introduces at the formal level an opportunity to make distinctions, which though perhaps dimly present in intuitive base, goes beyond it in sharpness and formal clarity. And so as an example, he considers, uh, 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 the difference between um, saying zero is equal to two implies zero is equal to one, All right? So we should find uh, occasions in which intuitively A horseshoe B is, should be provable when A right arrow B should not be provable, All right? So in the case of zero is equal to one, right? Meyer says, look, it's not at all at issue that zero is equal to two should materially imply zero is equal to one, um, right? Because zero is equal to two being false, right? Should, should satisfy, uh, you know, A, right? A horseshoe B for any, any B, right? Because it trivially satisfies uh, the truth conditions for the material implication. But, what he says is that we should not expect that zero is equal to two should relevantly imply zero is equal to one, right? If we were to hypothetically overload arithmetic so as to identify zero and two, it would just be gratuitous to suppose that we should thereby have identified zero and one. Indeed, when we take the integers modulo two, we do identify zero and two without going on to identify zero and one. So, uh, this is I, this is again kind of at you know a conceptual level that the argument's being made. So we I, I mean and I think that you can concoct reasons that zero is equal to one follows in a law-like fashion from zero is equal to two, but the idea here is that it doesn't follow conceptually, right? It doesn't seem to follow from the properties of the numbers zero, one, and two that an identity between zero and two should lead to an identity between zero and, and any uh, arbitrary number. Uh, so Thomas, so can I ask uh, another question here? So would you be making the same arguments if we went the other way? If zero equals one, then zero equals two? Well, actually, so in relevant arithmetic, uh, yeah, zero is equal to one does imply zero is equal to two relevantly. Uh, 
And that's because the properties of the natural numbers mean that if you've collapsed everything right there at the, at the beginning, right, then, then everything, everything essentially trivializes. Right. But, but, but in other words, so the way we should understand it, that in relevance, the relevance can come from the ambience, right? So this from the understanding of the situation you're in. Right? Not necess- it's, not, it's not something syntactic, it's something very much semantic. Yes. Um, and look, I mean, so uh, when we did this this volume, right, uh, and the paper that I contributed, I contributed a paper with my my student at, at Unum that I recused myself from editing, right? Um, but when the referees, you know, I, I, I cited this example of Meyer in the introduction of the paper, and when the referees came up with a very clever proof that, you know, in a law-like fashion, right, from the identification of zero is equal to two, we should identify zero is equal to one. So I'm not trying to press this as an inescapable, right, uh, you know, uh, you know, phenomenon. Um, but it, it's really, I mean, from a phenomenological perspective, right, it seems like there is a difference between saying the nature of like, look, zero and zero is equal to two happens to be false. And therefore zero is equal to two implies B for arbitrary B. That seems to be like a distinct uh, procedure from saying, look, zero is equal to two. And therefore by the, from the very properties and concepts involved of zero and two, it must follow that zero is equal to one, right? It's an it's a arithmetical law. There seems to be a different act that I'm engaging in in either case. And the fact that there's a phenomenological distinction, I know, doesn't always mean that there is in fact a distinction, but I mean, Meyer views that as important enough to be able to preserve in the language itself. And that's something that R sharp does in fact afford us. Um, okay, so it's just saying that look, there, there appears to be a different kind of speech act maybe that we engage in when we utter a material conditional and like a law-like entailment. And as such, right, we should be interested in representing or expressing that very distinction. We can make it, our formal language should be rich enough to respect it. And that's the, that's the, the point. And R sharp can offer us that option. Um, okay, so second point that is important and it's gonna be important in the sort of aftermath of the Friedman result. Um, you're right. Uh, it might occur, he gives a paper and then, you know, he has a lot of meta theorems that are proven. And he points out that one is justified in asking like, look, are you're writing about one deductive system and you're rejecting classical reasoning. Are you just engaging in classical reasoning when you're doing your meta reasoning? And if so, does that render the entire thing fallacious, right? So you know, one is justified in asking if, you know, the technical arguments of this paper are relevantly valid. And he points out, again, an analogy with hiding arithmetic, where, you know, we don't want to, um, you know, it it, it would seem kind of illegitimate if we were to be Browarians, right, and we were to discuss models of hiding arithmetic and to do so on completely classical grounds. Look, as, as model theorists, and I do this, I think that intuitionistic logic is cool, and I, I reason about it classically, but I'm not a committed Browarian. If I'm a committed intuitionist, then there's something very illicit about that, um, right? So the intuitionistic partisan uh, disagrees with us at the informal level, he notes, right? The intuitionist is in revolt about what has passed previously as good mathematical reasoning, right? So the intuitionist has, uh, it's committed in some sense because it's it's such a deeply revisionary program to saying that look yeah you can't reason about models of hiding arithmetic uh, using a classical uh, uh, meta theory right there's there's something that's illegitimate about doing that but Meyer anticipating this kind of objection says that look the the, the relevant logics they cannot stand in starker contrast right and the reason is that uh, well, I'll read them again. Despite objections that the relevant logics lack disjunctive syllogism or other components of intuitively valid reasoning, the relevant claim has not been that these intuitive principles are incorrect, 
What is argued rather is that the formalization of our informal reasoning has been incorrect, right? So there's a big difference. Like the meta reasoning that we engage in when we talk about models of relevant arithmetic um, is not the problem, right? The problem is how we would parse that in a formal language, right? So relevant logic and relevant, according to Meyer, by, by Meyer's perspective, and relevant arithmetic is not revisionary in the same sense that intuitionism is, right? Intuitionism says that, look, you're, the reason why you can't reason about heighting arithmetic models uh, classically is because intuitionist principles prevent you from doing so, right? Hiding arithmetic, the models of hiding arithmetic are infinitary mathematical objects. And so the same type of constructivism has to be part and parcel about how you reason about the model theory, right? Relevant logic says, look, your normal reasoning is right. That's what we're trying to preserve here. So of course your meta reasoning, when you're reasoning about models of uh, relevant arithmetic is fine, because that's exactly, that's our point is that that's good. It's just that classical, the, you know, the, the, the kind of deductive system you get for a, in a classical logic doesn't actually reflect what we do as informal reasoners. So that's the second important point. And this is gonna be, I think, critical in terms of what, why Myers backed into a corner uh, in the, in the, from, after the freedom result. Classical, like the, the reasoning about, mo the model theoretic reasoning we do when we're reading, reasoning about right, uh, uh, you know, the models of relevant arithmetic is fine. It's supposed to be respected. That, that's put on a pedestal in some sense. So there's nothing wrong about our reasoning in the meta theory at all, in contrast to like, you know, the intuitions. So, um, yeah, just a, a big distinction right there between you know what an intuitionist might say and, and Meyer would say. Okay, so positive results. Why would R sharp be appealing? Okay, um, I'll I'll read you because look, Meyer Meyer is a fantastic writer. So sometimes it's just nice to put him in his own words. So in the monograph consistency of arithmetic. Uh, Right, he, in, in the introduction, right, he writes, this paper reinstates the formal program, which is often taken to have been blasted away by Gödel's theorems, namely the Hilbert program of demonstrating by methods that everybody can recognize as effective and finitary, that intuitive mathematics is reliable. Indeed, the present consistency proof for arithmetic will be recognized as correct by anyone who can count to three. So much indeed for the claim that reliability of arithmetic rests on transfinite induction, induction up to epsilon, not the incredible mythology that underlies it. But this is the important bit. He's going to show us that there are non-theorems of R sharp and that proof can be recognized without, you know, in, in, in a finite period of time. And we're going to recognize it ourselves, right? By the time we're done. So the idea is that, and it's reliable in an important sense as well. So irrespective of the correctness of the reasoning that goes into Gödel's second theorem, Hil Hilbert's program in some sense can be reinstated if we embrace R sharp, says Meyer, because we can see that we're never going to be led all that astray uh, by arithmetic, right? Even if there is a formal statement of, a cons of its consistency that we can't prove, we can see that it's not this trivial theory that proves everything. Uh, Thomas, one more question. Now, at, at this point, maybe this is something you can discuss later. But my understanding is that you know, because of Gödel's results and the, the, the history that what happened later, uh, well, we, we we worry about consistency of number theory. But uh, Hilbert's program went went much beyond that. He wanted consistency of mathematics. He wanted consistency of infinitistic methods. Mm -hmm. So, uh, did Meyer do anything about that? Is there anything in his writing about about that version? You want, you want to justify the use of infinite in mathematics by finitistic methods. Yeah, so, um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, in, insofar as these are papers on arithmetic, I, I mean, I think that the aspect of Hilbert's program with which he's primarily interested is, is you know, this, this plank of the program that arithmetic can be proven uh, correct in some sense uh, on, on finitary grounds. Um, but the same 
if you look at work on relevant uh, class theory, relevant set theory, if you look at work on relevant analysis, um, I think that you can make similar arguments mm-hmm. um, in virtually any any branch of mathematics. Um, the proof that Meyer provides, the, the technique, I guess, is is a very general one. And mm-hmm. it all presupposes that you're working in a relevant logic like R um, or or a, a logic that can tolerate inconsistencies like R. I see. Well, but does, does he ever mention the Essenian Volpin? Uh, does he? No, 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 he does not. Um, no, he mentions like, uh, he, he does mention Gris. Um, so he, he, is concerned with sort of like revisionary, you know, like more st- stricter versions of constructive reasoning. But mm-hmm. he, I don't think that he has any reference to Essendine Volpin at all. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I could go through that, but all right, I, I don't, I don't believe so. I don't recall any any reference made. Yeah, but there is, there's. I mean, I, I think that uh, you know, at, at a very intuitive level. I mean, there's a sense in which doing things through finitary means, you can be satisfied, you know, you do the task, you can be satisfied by it. And there's something attractive about that. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I, yeah, let me, I'll, I'll look through. I don't, or, or you, like, you can go to the, you can go to the special issue. You can, you can search through because most of Myers work is, is in there right now. So, um, but I don't, I don't believe there is any reference to S and equal fiend in that. No. Um, okay. But, but yeah. But, okay. So, Bear that in mind, as I, you know, we talk about this this proof of the adequacy of R sharp, the, the finitary proof that it's a it's a pretty general, uh, th- you know, thing. It can be adapted. I mean, I've used it, and I've adapted this proof technique to uh, like arithmetic, uh, the the constructive arithmetic of David Nelson. Um, uh, Graham, Graham, is, Graham himself has used this technique. Uh, for you know other models of of arithmetic, so it's it's a very general proof technique, and I think you could easily apply it to like you know set theory um, as well. Okay, so the 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 road that we're going to go, I'm doing this a slightly different way than Meyer. I'm using a slightly different uh, deductive system, but I think it's it makes for a very sort of pithy, uh, succinct explanation. Um, so R is a is a you know a, if you look at it as a Hilbert style system, I mean it's a deductive calculus. And then there's classical logic. You look at the you know Hilbert style systems for classical logic. And of course there are going to be deductive systems that are intermediate between those two, right? Um, uh, by adding maybe an axiom or two, we can generate systems that are stronger than R, but are not yet equivalent. To classical logic. Okay, one, um, you know, the one such like system, right, is this logic RM three, which is a three-valued logic. It's not relevant. It doesn't have those properties of relevance that R does. Um, but it is uh, very easily described. So the models for RM three are easy to work with, where the models for R are impossible to work with. I mean, they're, they're easy to work with, but they're also, um, they're very, they, they can be very uh, difficult to employ. The models of RM3 are very, very straightforward. So you can look at this model theoretically by just saying we've got these three valued matrices for negation, disjunction, and uh, conjunction, and for this implication connective. And we have an ordering of these th- these three values. T is greater than B is greater than F. And uh, the quantifiers can be interpreted modulus ordering as just uh, mapping sets of truth values to the minimum and the maximum of those sets of truth values. Uh, but, so, but, you also, but you also say that greater and or equal. So can they all be the same? Oh, no. Uh, no, they're distinct. Um, um, yeah, trick of the notation I, I chose. Um, uh, 
you know, they're distinct elements. Um, but yeah, T is, is greater than B on this ordering. B is greater than F. Um, yeah, I only it's only there so that you can grasp what, so it's well-defined to say what the minimum and maximum are for the evaluation of quantifiers. Um, okay, so what we're able to do with RM3, so importantly, here's, the, here's why RM3 is important and why the RM3, the finite, the, the, the finite value models are important. As an extension of R, if you uh, evaluate arithmetic in RM3, you've gotten a you've got a model of R sharp. Also importantly, as, as an extension of R, if you find something that is not provable in the theory of arithmetic in RM3, then it's also not provable in R. Right, so RM3 is, is going to act as a sort of a proxy, right? It's like we're fighting a proxy war over here. We look at arithmetic in RM3, uh, we find uh, a model, we look at its theory, we see that it is, uh, um, it includes R sharp, and we see that there are formulas that are, there are senses that are not included in that theory, and what we're able to infer then is that R sharp itself does not prove everything. There are models of R sharp. Maybe they're not the models that one might expect, but there are models of R sharp that do not prove, do not make everything true, and therefore R sharp has counter theorems. Right. So it's and so Thomas, but models are also in the sense of the of those the, the truth values here. So this is the, these are the truth values by which we're going to evaluate the models. So I'll, I'll, I'll define the models in two slides. Um, but this is, these are, I mean, so like you can view, um, actually, yeah. So we'll, um, essentially you can view like atomic, uh, like the predicates, right? As uh, mapping tuples. Classically, we view like a, a, a unary predicate R as mapping objects to the values true or false, which is generalized from there. And a, a unary predicate is going to be interpreted by a function that maps objects to one of the three values, right? So uh, the, the, um, the diagram, right, is going to be sort of, it's going to be essentially three values, right? And then these allow us, these definitions of connectives and of quantifiers allow us to recursively infer the truth values of more complex formulas in the model on the basis of what the atoms have assigned. So yeah, this is, this is the model theory. This is the semantics. And then we're going to look at models themselves. And maybe, maybe it'll become a little bit more clear when I actually introduce a class of models. But yeah, they just generalize. You can view models, classical models as mapping you know, functions mapping tuples uh, to true and false. In, in RM3, we map those tuples to three values, and then we evaluate complex formulas via the, follow, the, the schema that follow it. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. So <clears throat> importantly, right, uh, we have this notion of designated value when we deal with many valued logics. Um, and so we don't necessarily want to just define truth in a model, but we can have something similar, which something is you know, uh, designated in a model, which is typically intent, uh, interpreted as something that's sort of truth, truth likeness. Um, so the values T and B are designated. So if a model ultimately assigns a sentence A, the value of T or the value of B, we're going to say that 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 essentially is made true in the model, right? So uh, the model A, if it evaluates this formula, assigns this formula, uh, the value of either T or B, then the model uh, is a model of that formula. So you, again, designated is just a generalization of the of truth in a two-valued model, right? It's essentially, uh, you know, satisfaction in some sense. Okay, so, we can look at an actual model um, and um, this will give us, this will hopefully sort of show how that schema that we just looked at actually gives us truth conditions in a, in a model. So we're gonna define uh, a, a series of models of R sharp. 
So um, we're going to say, look, that um, we're going to take as a, for each of these AI models for every positive natural number. We're going to take the domain as the ring of integers mod i. We're going to interpret numerals and, uh, and, and as, as normal, like you're going to interpret two as the uh, equivalence class of two in the ring of integers mod i. We're going to interpret successor, again, just as taking the successor in that ring of integers. So numerals and successor, we're going to interpret normally. Uh, binary functions, addition and multiplication, we're going to view that as, you know, uh, modular addition multiplication in the ring of integers, mod whatever. Um, and for the truth conditions, we only have to worry about uh, identity. That's our only predicate. So what we're going to say is that for two numerals or for two numbers, right, we're going to say that it is, it is uh, it receives the value of t or b in case uh, the interpretation of those numbers coincide. And we're going to say that it's not the case or not, not S is equal to T is satisfied. Oh, shoot. Oh yeah, for all terms, for all terms, right? Um, so what that means is that if we go back, uh, every, every identity, in one of these models is going to be either B or F, right? Um, the negation of every identity is going to be satisfied. Um, sometimes some identities are going to be valued as B and that's gonna hold in case the interpretations of those, those two expressions in fact coincide. So uh, zero is equal to one. Um, or zero is equal to zero is going to be B because uh, zero is equal to zero, zero, the, the element is in fact identified with zero. And also uh, its negation is, is made true in the model in some sense. So both the identity and its negation are made true. It, that means it's, it's B. I'm sorry, I, I took this out. I, I probably should have in, uh, written this in a slightly different fashion, um, but, What's important, right, is that everything is either B or F because uh, every, uh, actually, yeah. Um, every identity is either B or F. Uh, if two, if we're in the, the ring and two uh, numbers are in fact denote different uh, uh, integers in the ring of integers mod I, if they're different, then it's going to be evaluated as F, that atomic formula. If they are in fact the same, it's gonna be identified as B. That's the, the upshot. Um, so I'd like to give an example of, of what these models are gonna look like is in A1, right? It's just gonna be the element zero closed under successor, essentially. So zero, one, two, three are all going to be interpreted as this element. So this is gonna be very trivial. Um, but if we look at the integers mod three, right, we've got zero, one, two, three, four, five, and, and so forth. What we're gonna have is uh, three is equal to zero is going to be valued as B because three is in fact, the, the denotation of the numeral three is in fact identical with the denotation of the numeral zero. They do in fact denote the same object, but everything is also uh, not equal to itself in some sense. So zero is equal to three is gonna receive the value of B and it's gonna be designated in this model. Uh, two is equal to one is going to be just F in this model, right? Because the interpretation of the numeral one is distinct from the interpretation of the numeral two. And therefore, uh, they're not identified, and therefore it's not. It's just going to be F, and it's not going to be uh, valid in the model. So we can we can go through this. Um, <coughs> I'm sorry, to show that, for example, A two is in fact a model of R sharp. So 
because it's evaluated by an extension of R sharp, all the axiom of R, all the axioms of R are satisfied. Um, but we would just need to go and check these um, axioms. So what we can do though, with the, we're, because we only have two elements in this model, is that all of these a priori infinitary axioms reduce down just to finite conjunctions and disjunctions essentially, right? So for all X and Y, the successor of X, if the successor of X is equal to the successor of Y, then X is equal to Y. Because we only have two, the, the domain of quantification is only two elements, this just breaks down to evaluating this conjunction, right? So um, <clears throat> in this model, one is equal to one is valued as B, zero is equal to zero is equal, valued as B. So if we have B and B in our truth table, then the implication the entailment right here is valued as B. So this is satisfied in the model. Uh, this for the same reason is going to be satisfied. Zero is equal to one is going to be valued as F. It's always true. So these two are going to be true as well, right? So the conjunction of B and B and T and T is just B, that's a designated value. And therefore the finitary conjunction that the axiom A11 sort of broke into can be seen very quickly to be valid or true designated in this model, All right? So these are the kinds of moves that we're able to make very easily. So this a priori infinitary axiom A12, right? That all numbers are, it's you know, not the case that they are equal to zero. This just breaks down to this one uh, simple thing, right? So it's not the case, I'm sorry, it's not the case that zero is equal to zero. Uh, zero is equal to zero is B. So not zero is equal to zero is equal to B. Uh, one is equal to zero is F. So not one is equal to zero is T. And then we just, again, the conjunction of B and T is equal to B. So this is, this is designated as well. So we can go through that for each of the Piana axioms and see that they're all true. The, you know, and it, even, even the rule of induction, right, is, is pretty simple, right? This is even, even simpler, right? If we suppose that the formula A is true of zero and for all X, uh, if A uh, is true of X, then A is true of the successor, then A is true of all X. Right, again, because we only have two elements, this rule breaks down to the verification of this very simple clause. And it's, it's trivial, according to the semantics, that if A is zero, A is true of zero is designated, and the, the implication, if A is true of zero, then A is true of one, then we have that conclusion. A is true of zero by assumption, and A is, uh, is true of one uh, by uh, the fact that it's closed under modus ponens. So in this way, Looking at these models, we, we can see that the theory of R sharp has models in which, uh, oh, I'm sorry, has models. These are the models of R sharp. And here's the important thing, right? Uh, it's non trivial, right? So the theory, I'm sorry, there's a thing missing there, but the theory is non trivial. Zero is equal to one is just strictly assigned the value of F. Right, so it's not designated in the model. So looking at these finite models, we have exposed a model of R sharp, and that does not prove everything. It's not, not everything is true in the model. And so by sound and completeness, the theory R sharp does not prove everything. And the important thing right here is that this procedure that we engaged in right here, it broke down into a finitary task, a very tractable finitary task in fact. Right, so what you know, the, why this is being interpreted by Meyer as a sort of uh, restarting or a vindication of the Hilbert program in some sense is that we're able to see the adequacy of arithmetic in R, and we're able to do that in, in a finite period of time. If we sat down and we did this on paper, it would take us five minutes. Thomas, yes. Uh, is there a, a simple uh, first order axiom that would force the model to be infinite? No. 
No. I said, that's, well, that's, no, no, no matter what you do, you, you you always end up with some something. You you can end up with something fine. And I'll show you why very quickly. Look at this guy right here. Right. So think about the diagram. The diagram is just zero is equal to one and not zero. Oh, the elementary diagram is just zero is equal to one and not zero is equal to one. Mm -hmm. And then if you go through these, right, your inputs are always B and everything else is B. And the same thing is going to hold for the quantifiers. So this is going to be a finite, essentially, model of, of the entire language. Of anything. I see. Yeah. So that's, I mean, part of the problem. And this is why, I, I mean, like, why I'm a bilateralist, right? Is that it's easy to make bad things true. The trick is in preventing things from being true. And in the typical way we express things, we can't avoid that. We can't guarantee things to not hold. We can guarantee that the negations of things hold, but it, we don't have the ability to, to rule out models by adding new things, essentially. Yeah, so, um, yeah, and, and that, I mean, this is the reason right here is we have an entirely trivial, trivial model right here. The, but the important thing is that if we look at things that are sort of intermediate there, we do have models of R sharp that omit certain things as being valid. Okay, so uh, what this means then is that R sharp is, is post consistent, right? Post consistent means that there are in fact sentences that are not provable in a theory. Is May it I ask a question also? I'm sorry, second. Uh, I like I have a question also, if I may. Yes. Um, you mentioned briefly soundness and completeness. Um, now, from something you were saying earlier about models, it made me doubt that. Uh, have, has it been proved that this logic is sound and complete? Yes, but it hasn't been proven by finitary means that it's sound and complete, necessarily. So, yes, I mean, RM3 is, these are the intended semantics for RM3. Um, that is provably sound and complete with respect to RM3. So it, it's... This, I haven't given you the Hilbert cell axiomatization, but this is sounding complete with respect to the semantics. R, yeah, R is incomplete. Oh, but sorry, but so how is soundness defined? Soundness means that if something is provable, uh, that every, every uh, model, that the validity follows. So if from set, some set of hypotheses, you can prove phi, then in every set of every model of those hypotheses, phi holds. Well, it sounds like tautology. <laughs> right? Uh, the ontological issue, yeah. I mean, Meyer touches on that. Actually, his co-author uh, in, in some of these papers, Chris Mortensen, uh, write some stuff about the ontological import of these models. And it's questionable. I mean, like we don't expect, like these, these things, these things are not the natural numbers, right? Right. So we don't, I mean, Meyer doesn't think that when we're doing arithmetic, these are the models that we're necessarily thinking about, but they're a formal device. And but, they're a formal device but, to show. But, but even philosophically, there is no intended model or is there an intended model? But these are just devices to, to sort of... Yeah, no, we, yeah, there is an intended model. I mean, like, you know, that, that math BBN is constantly present, right? That's what we care about. So, so but I guess this is what Laurie was asking about. So, so, is, so whatever is provable, it is not necessarily proof in, uh, true in the standard model, is it? Or oh, it's true in every model, so in particular in the standard yeah, model. Yeah. That's what you're saying. All right. Look, we've got, I mean, and we're not going to get to what I wanted to say about that, but I mean, we've got the same issues in some sense. So you've got the same, you've got these issues in, as a classical logician, right? That you can't ever, you've got these, this class of, of well, you like them, <laughs> but you've got these, this class of larger models that are larger than what you intended, right? Um, you've got models with non-standard natural numbers. And that's not, the, that's not N, that's not the intended model, but that you can't rule them out. In a sense, you've got 
a similar thing going on in the other direction, right? Mm -hmm. You've got models that are smaller than you'd intended. That, but the thing is, is that these, these models, the smaller ones that are admitted now in R sharp, right? Are things that we can deal with very, very swiftly and through fi finitarily, right? So that's, yeah, you, I mean, it, it's a similar, it's, it's like it's a similar problem of having non, you know, unintended non-standard models going up it's just repeated going down, but the difference, right, is that these guys are very tractable. Yeah, so, um, oops, okay, so, yeah, let me, let me rush through really quick, okay, so, like, this is the, this is the idea, what this does, again, we don't need to assign it any more ontological import than it, than it warrants, um, we can view these things as just completely technical devices, Clearly, this is not the intended model. A2 is not the intended model. But what it shows is it's a proof theoretic demonstration that R sharp doesn't prove everything. Um, I'll give you one further observation that uh, Meyer takes to mean you know, show this is adequate. Um, and uh, th that if something is intuitively true, if K in equals L is a, a correct numerical equation, that the natural numbers that K denotes and L denotes are in fact identical, then R sharp proves K is equal to L. And if it's incorrect, the intended uh, referent of K is distinct from the intended referent of L in the natural numbers, then R sharp proves the negation of K is equal to L. Notably though, and this touches on what you pointed out about adding new axioms, this is not that R sharp does not prove K is equal to L if K is equal to L is incorrect but it refutes it in the sense of proving its negation. So Meyer takes us as further evidence of the adequacy of R sharp. Okay, um, so let me, so that was the rise of Meyer's program. And let me try and briefly go through the, the sort of fall of Meyer's program. Um, so yeah, so this is sort of viewed as a vindication in some sense of, of at least one, one aspect of the Hilbert program. We just went and we saw a theory of arithmetic. In many ways, it seems adequate. It gets things right in the right places um, and it refutes the right things. Um, and we can see that it's post consistent, not negation, not negation consistent necessarily, but we can prove that it's post consistent. Um, so it doesn't give us everything. And this, we can do that by clearly finitary means. So you know, Meyer interpreted this as a vindication of, of the Hilbert program, and in some sense, a sidestepping of Gödel's second complete step. Um, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to I'm going to think about using time correctly. So these are attractive things. I think they're alluring things, right? Um, I don't think that you need to be, you know, like all that heterodox to say actually, you know, that's 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 suggestive at the very least. So where does this go wrong? Why isn't, why did, you know, did his two monographs only get published 50 years later? Why is there not this huge interest in this? Like what actually caused this program to fall? And uh, that's what we're gonna describe right now. So as, uh, as a lead up, uh, I'm gonna give you a critical sort of thing for what Meyer views as the adequacy of R sharp. And we're going to see that it fails. Uh, okay, so in in his monographs, I'm sorry, it, we have this triangle operator. Um, this triangle operator is a unary operator. It's definable as uh, triangle A is it's not that zero is not equal to zero or A. Right, so it's a sort of indirect way of asserting A. And by a theorem of Meyer that we won't go into, it's proof theoretic, right? R sharp proves triangle A, I'm sorry, it's a, it should be an if and only if, if and only if A is a theorem of PA, right? So we have this way of sort of translating everything in piano arithmetic and classical piano arithmetic back into R sharp. Um, so it's an interesting question though, whether or not A directly translates into R sharp, right? And if uh, if Meyer's intuition that R sharp gets the mathematical practice right, 
then we should anticipate that we should expect, we should demand maybe that everything that is true in classical arithmetic is in fact true in relevant arithmetic as well. So that Meyer views has an important component of its adequacy. So, 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 yeah. so I understand that the second theorem of Meyer has some kind of non-finitistic proof then. Um, no, no, yeah, this is, this is, this is fine. You can, you, this is a binary proof. It's a finite. It's, it's a proof theoretic thing. So, so why doesn't it prove con, con PA in PA? What's the, what it would, what it would, well, because we don't know whether con PA is provable, right? So if con PA is provable in con PA, Oh, I see, because this consistency of, of relevant arithmetic is not about the sentence con PA, it's about consistency of R. Right, okay. Yeah, well, yeah, and but also, I mean, if, all right, so it is a consequence, and again, Meyer, this is why Meyer, I think, is not a Cantor crank, right? This is why Meyer is, a, I don't think, Meyer is not a Cantor crank, and mm -hmm. because he's willing to accept the consequences of things. If PA is inconsistent, right, then Meyer's willing to say that, okay, Triangle A holds for every A. And, you know, he says, like, that might be the case. That might be the case. Mm -hmm. He's bounded. He acknowledges that there are restraints that are placed on the relevant logician by Girdle as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So, absolutely. Maybe con PA is provable. Maybe every formula is provable in PA. All that means for R sharp is that triangle A is going to be provable. But if R sharp is to be adequate, he says, then it would be nice if we could remove that so that every theorem of PA is in fact a theorem of R sharp, not on translation, but directly. Because that would be, you know, important for the, its adequacy. Like you say, you, you as a mathematician, your first question that probably pops into your head when you look at R sharp is, okay, but could I do, could I do all of my arithmetic in this, right? Like, are there, aren't there, should, why, how do I know there aren't really natural theorems of arithmetic of number theory that I can't prove in R sharp, right? So it's, you know, it's viewed as, a, as an, uh, you know, adequacy. We don't, you know, as a philosopher, a logician, a philosophical logician, I don't want to walk into a math department and say, hey, actually, that thing you just proved, that's not valid because it's not relevantly valid. Like that's, again, this is intended as a, as a, a to capture actual mathematical practice as it's, as it's practiced on the fourth floor, right, of the building. Uh, and as such, a uh, criterion, you know, necessary condition for its adequacy should be intuitively that it in fact gives you all the theorems that you had wanted as an informal mathematician, right? Okay, so what does a standard fall with? Um, just as uh, this, the standard falls with the admissibility of this rule gamma, right? So gamma, is this inference rule, uh, A and not A or B, then for B, disjunctive syllogism, right? Or alternately, you can view this as modus ponens for the material conditional, right? So uh, a little background, right? Um, uh, we're gonna say that gamma is admissible in a theory if the theory is closed under the rule, right? That's different than saying that it's valid according to the logic, right? What it means is that the theory is closed under it, right? So it doesn't mean that we can employ, so if gamma is admissible, that doesn't mean we can deploy this as a matter of logical practice or arbitrarily. What that means is that we have a closed theory, its theorems are closed under that, you know, closed under that rule. So prior to Myers' investigation of R sharp in, Every relevant theory that had been looked at, it turned out that gamma was admissible. So this provided some a priori evidence that gamma may be admissible in R sharp too, right? Because in, uh, you know, like second order R and R uh, with quantification, all, you know, a number of theories, gamma had been proven to be admissible. So, you know, well, okay, maybe it's admissible in R sharp. Um, so, oh. I'm sorry, a slide went missing, but essentially what is important here? Why does R sharp important or why is, why is gamma admissibility important for these purposes? Well, uh, Meyer showed that if you can eliminate 
these triangles, that the elimination of triangles is equivalent to the admissibility of gamma. So the rule, if triangle A, then A, that's the eliminability of triangles, that rule is equivalent to the admissibility of gamma, which you can prove pretty swiftly. And if that rule is admissible, then by this, you get that if PA uh, you know, proves a theorem, then R sharp proves triangle A, and by that triangle admit, uh, eliminability, then R sharp proves A, right? So whether or not R sharp is so-called PA complete, if it proves every theorem of PA, is equivalent to the matter of whether gamma is admissible or not. Okay. Yeah, so this, uh, yeah, so this, uh, this sets up the stage for this, this negative result due to Friedman. Um, gamma is not, okay. Yeah, so um, gamma is not, as it turns out, admissible in R-sharp. Okay, so the way that Friedman and Meyer prove this, um, and, and therefore it's not PA complete. So the way that Meyer improved this is by uh, uh, looking at a sequence of theories, right? So first we define R-sharp plus, uh, which is the collection of all strictly positive theorems of R-sharp. Um, and we can axiomatize this by dropping negation from the language and dropping that non-predecessor of zero axiom. All right. So we have a theory R sharp plus, which is essentially just the positive fragment of R sharp. From this, we can prove, a, we can define a classical theory called PA plus. And we do this by adding these two axiom schemas to the language or to the, to the, to the axiomatic base, right? So we add these two things to the positive fragment of R sharp, and we have a positive theory in the language of arithmetic. Um, and that's importantly classical because adding these two axioms makes the logic classical. So we have a classical theory PA plus that extends R sharp plus. And now importantly, right, although PA plus is positive because all of, its, all of its formulas omit the negation sign, although they can admit this uh, implication, because of this, we can define a notion of negation in PA plus. We could define negation as zero is equal to one implies A. And, um, what this would generate then is a definitional extension of this of this theory PA plus, which uh, includes that definition of negation. So we could uh, evaluate the entire language on the basis of this interpretation, generating this theory P plus. Now, sorry, there's like a number of steps, it's not it's a little bit baroque there, but um, we can also view this as adding the axiom. It's not the case of zero is equal to one. Uh, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah. So if we add the axiom, it's not the case of zero is equal to one to P plus, we get classical PA. So we have essentially um, a fragment of PA in which the successor axiom is not dissolved. But importantly, we've defined negation. So it has a notion of negation in play. Okay. So in order to get PA completeness, we would need gamma to be admissible. And uh, Meyer shows us that if gamma is admissible in R sharp, then this condition FC holds. Every strictly positive theorem of PA is a theorem of this theory P plus. Um, this is pretty straightforward, right? So for a strictly positive theorem of PA, um, because it's proven in PA by that theorem that we looked at earlier, R sharp proves triangle A. If gamma is admissible because it's equivalent to triangle eliminability, that mean, would mean that R-sharp proves A. So because it's positive, if R-sharp proves A, then R-sharp plus proves A. And as a 
uh, expansion by new axioms. That means that PA plus proves A. And also that would mean that P plus proves A. So if gamma is admissible, then this condition FC must hold. Everything that's provable in PA that's positive can be proven in this theory P plus. And importantly, as this is a, is a classical theory, everything is essentially classical model theory from this point on. So um, I'm looking at the time. I, and I don't wanna go too deeply into things, but we have, we have some important things about what we're gonna do is we're gonna show that that complex ring C is a model of P plus, right? Um, just in virtue of time, no, I like this. I think it's beautiful. We'll run through this because it's beautiful. Every definable subset of the complex ring in the language of, of rings is either finite or cofinite. Um, this is gorgeous. So I just don't read it. Um, so uh, we can just do this by uh, a How much definability is, 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 is first order? Classical, yeah. Classical. Yeah. So the uh, theory of C emits quantifier elimination. So we can assume without loss of generality that we're only looking at formulas with one free variable that is quantifier free. Uh, if it's atomic, then uh, it's a polynomial in X with coefficients in C. Uh, so that means it has finite degree and therefore finitely many roots in C. And therefore either this set alpha, the class of definable terms and uh, elements is either C itself or it's finite. And if it's not atomic, then because we assumed without loss of generality that's quantifier free, then this set, the set of def, uh, complex numbers defined that define defined by A of X, uh, is just had by applying intersection, union, or complement to finite or cofinite sense sets that were defined by its subformulas, and that may ensure that the set of definable terms by AX is either, or I'm sorry, definable elements is either finite or cofinite itself. So I, I think that's, I think that's cute, it's gorgeous. But yeah, so every definable subset um, of the ring of complex numbers is either finite or cofinite. Um, importantly, right, we have this kind of really strong induction axiom that holds um, in, in C, right? Um, and we can, prove that this holds uh, because if we look at the set of complex numbers satisfying A of X, because A of X will be closed under successor, um, it's infinite and therefore by the previous lemma, it must be cofinite. Uh, and then, but if we look at the complement C uh, minus A or alpha, that's gonna be closed under predecessor. And that must be either cofinite or empty for, for similar reasons. But as alpha is cofinite, that means that the complex numbers uh, minus alpha must be empty. So the set alpha is the complex numbers. So that means that this schema of induction, if there's anything satisfying A and it's closed under successor, that means that everything, A is true of everything, is true in, in the complex numbers. So Friedman, show that C is a model of this theory P plus. Everything but induction is trivial. And we just saw that this really strong version of induction holds. So all the Piano axioms, without that, there is no, uh, no predecessor to zero, um, is, you know, is, is shown to be true of uh, C. And Meyer suggests that we have this quadratic residue formula um, that translates into the language of arithmetic. Um, and uh, it can be shown that this quadratic residue formula is provable in PA, but it's not true in the complex numbers. And as it can be phrased in the language of arithmetic by you know, moving around minus signs and, and so forth, that means it's not a theorem of P plus. So what this shows then is that that, that FC condition is false. There are positive formulas of piano arithmetic that are not provable in P plus because you have a positive sentence that is true of the natural numbers, but not true of the complex ring. And that means that uh, 
because it's a necessary condition on the admissibility of gamma, that gamma is not admissible in R sharp, but the admissibility of gamma is a necessary condition for the PA completeness of R sharp. So uh, what this means, right, is that R sharp does not contain PA. So I don't look as, as I'm not a math, I'm not trained as a mathematician. So I don't know how important this quadratic residue formula is, but look, and it, I mean, clearly this is a truth of number theory that is not provable in R sharp. So this is sort of a, uh, you know, a blow to the adequacy of R sharp. And certainly because Meyer, right, what is argued is that the formalization of our informal reasoning has been incorrect. It's correct in R. Then, you know, you, you, this, is, this is a resounding blow from Meyer's perspective to the program of R sharp. So um, while some work followed in this, Meyer wrote a couple more papers after this. Um, I, it is sort of, I think, you know, it, it tapered off after this. Um, there were some, you know, Meyer had some ideas about finding a system that was intermediate between R sharp and R sharp sharp. R sharp sharp is R sharp with an omega rule. Uh, and, you know, did some thinking about finding something that's intermediate. So maybe there's an extension of R sharp that still can be proven post consistent via finite theory means. And yet for which, uh, uh, you know, gamma is still admissible, but didn't really get anywhere. Although there's a really great paper that sort of points at this in that collection um, by Shay Logan and one of his co Graham Lee Crouch. I'm sorry. Uh, his co-author um, uh, that suggests that, you know, because this does a little bit of work to showing like maybe there are some cool intermediate systems right there. But um, yeah, but you know, that, that essentially gave you the, you know, the, the close of that Meyer program because we, uh, you know, it shows that not all mathematics in classical mathematics or on all number theory, classical number theory can be carried out straightforwardly in, in R. So, um, yeah, that, that sort of drove things to a close. So I'm running out of time, already over time. Um, but I do want to mention reasons that you know you might think R sharp is still worth thinking about. Um, and you can go to that volume, which I'll show you, and you can look at a number of people writing on like how directions and relevant logic can still be extended. But uh, one thing, and and Graham's student Zach Weber. Uh, as this uh, paper, transfinite numbers and paraconsistent set theory, that I think gives you know a really nice, you know, reason that something like R is still R sharp is still worth looking at, and other relevant theories are the pick, right? Um, and this is in the context of of a set theory and a relevant logic, but right, the theory that he puts and it applies equally to Meyer uh, begins to address new mathematical questions that arise in coherent inconsistent settings showing that objects beyond the consistent are mathematically rich. So you can say, you know, like there are you know, these models, like maybe they're not the intended models, but it opens up sort of new venues or vistas, right? For mathematical exploration. I mean, they're still well-defined, some of these models. And what's more is that we can go and we can take ultra products of these finite models. And we can come up with, you know, really interesting and, uh, you know, uh, models of relevant, relevant arithmetic that have a really cool structure to them. And all of these things are, uh, you know, models that are opened up to us that were ruled out if we had been very restrictive in the, uh, the logic that we were using. So there are sort of new mathematically rich and mathematically interesting avenues that are opened when we look at something like R sharp. So even if the philosophical program uh, Meyer intended uh, ultimately sort of failed, uh, that's not to say that models of relevant arithmetic are not still worth looking at. Um, let, me, let me just say one last thing. Um, Meyer believed, right, that the Friedman result was decisive against R sharp because he was committed to saying that mathematical reason was essentially relevant and meta reasoning is essentially relevant. It's captured by R. And because the Friedman result was done in, in a meta theory that was acceptable to Meyer, it therefore conclusively you know, demonstrated that this FC condition failed. But it's not necessarily the case, 
right? You could be a little bit less sympathetic to Meyer and you could say some of the components of Friedman's result may have used reasoning patterns that were invalid relevantly and still free up a space for the Friedman proof not being acceptable in some sense. So that's, a, that's another avenue right there to try and you know, reinstate Meyer's program. There are ways that it can be done or you know, potential ways that it can be done. Uh, even even after that Friedman result in the 90s that sort of blew, you know, struck that blow to it. Um, okay, I'm gonna uh, jump past that. Just to close out, I'm gonna do again this advertisement that uh, Australasian Journal Logic 2021 um, includes a pretty exhaustive category, you know, class, uh, collection of this stuff. Meyer wrote two monographs, two books that he had never published in like 1976 on this that contained a lion's share of material. So those are typeset and published in this uh, volume. Uh, you got an annotated bibliography of all Meyer's work on the subject. Um, a number of papers that were very difficult to access that were published before or reprinted to provide some context. And also we uh, got seven new research papers um, on relevant arithmetic from sort of modern perspective, uh, talking about ways it can be developed. So um, I am very proud of it. Uh, Graham coded it with me. Um, and if anybody was interested was piqued, uh, please, by all means, it's open access. So you can go there and you can find out everything about my program you ever wanted to know. Yeah, so uh, that's what I have to say. I'm sorry it ran right up to the time allotted to me, but thank you very much for, for, uh, for your questions and for sticking around and listening to me. Thank you. Let's uh, let's all thank Tom as well. Uh, again, you can use your uh, you can unmute and clap, or you can happily use your emoji or whatever. Um, I uh, so first of all, can I ask if you do you have the link to that uh, ready? Then uh, you can just put put it in the chat um, to that to the uh, special issue. I do. Uh, let's. And put it in the chat. Chat. Yeah. Great. Like it. right, thank you. Uh, um, all right. Do, does anyone have any uh, any further questions for Tom? Go ahead, Zach. Uh, can I ask? Um, yeah. So, uh, um, thank you very much. Um, that uh, that quadratic residue formula. I mean, does the Friedman Meyer result show that? Um, you know, essentially, this is a theorem of, of number theory that um, requires irrelevant information. Or is that a correct interpretation? So there is. All right. So there is. I, I, I think there's some interesting yeah, questions there about like, how does that stand? Like, what do you make of the fact that it holds of the natural numbers? It, it doesn't hold of the complex ring or how, why does it hold of this axiomatization and but not hold if you drop the uh the there is no predecessor to zero axiom um yeah so i mean essentially you know that that requires okay so look there's there's and 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 roman had kind of you know pointed to this fact there is a difference between something's failing to hold and its negation holding in this logic right and it's um, what I think you can break down the difference is, is that it doesn't, it, requ it requires in some sense, right? It shows that there's a role of this, there is no predecessor to zero axiom. It re requires not just that it's it negation is true. It requires that it really is not present though. Wait, uh, oh, no, that's not, not the right way of thinking about it. Hmm. Yeah, there's a relationship there between that and the axiom of there is no predecessor to zero. Um, I don't know what, if it means that there's relevant information that's necessary. Um, yeah, so I suppose maybe my, my question was, how can you interpret this Friedman Meyer result in, in PA? I mean, does it show that this is a, you know, this is a theorem of PA that is, that somehow, I mean, it's, it's 
it's not relevant is it is it showing that it's not relevantly provable or yeah so it what it shows is that it's it, it cannot do that all right so yeah what it would show is in mm -hmm. from the piano axioms relevant logic does not have the strength to prove it um mm -hmm. i want to link this up to you it admits too many okay so this is why yeah it admits too many models in some sense it's too permissive in the class of models that it uh, that it allows right and what what it needs to do is it needs to really rule out models that authentically do not have a predecessor to zero but it can't do that right it can it, it admits models in which there is a predecessor to zero, although it also says, hey, it's false that there's a predecessor to zero or everything is also not a predecessor to zero. It doesn't rule that out. It still admits those models and is therefore it's not sufficiently strong to rule out that class of models that includes the complex ring. Um, now, in some sense, right, that's I think kind of murky when you look at those finite models because those finite models have a predecessor to zero but they also, because everything is not identical to a predecessor of zero, it also makes that axiom true. But it's sort of a trick in the way that it's doing it, right? Um, but it's obscured in that sense. And I think that what you get in the Friedman result is that you have, this, these are the consequences of, of sort of faking it, right, in some sense. If you don't actually rule out those models, then, uh, then you 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 don't have enough strength to prove this QRF. Well, I my comment about it. First of all, thank you very much, Thomas. This was a very very kind of uh, inspiring talk. But I, I think that you know the way I see it is that relevant logic this the, uh, it just takes care of some problem. It removes some sources of irrelevance. But perhaps there are other ways of maybe the strengthening of it that that give it a more proof theoretic power and still somehow avoid kinds of events i understand the 70s or even the 60s so for example what about those theorems of number theory that's not provable in pa okay so then you would have to have some version of and to, to see whether you know what, what, what um, zach was asking well are, are, the, are the statements of the, are the results relevant to the premises? But now we have to strengthen PA even to prove the, you know, like certain versions of Ramsey theorem, uh, then you would have to, so are those proofs relevant? You know, would, 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 that's what I was sort of going sort of with the question about set theory, you know, all kinds of things in set theory. Th there is one direction to look at. I think it's all very inspiring because this idea of what's relevant, I think this has been sort of taken to some other, you know, in number theory, all the proofs recent, you know, algebraic number theory that goes into higher level of, you know, infinities and abstract methods that to, to even to ask about the relevance of the methods, it's somewhat naive, right? You know, Fermat's last theorem or the ABC conjecture and whatnot, it goes into sort of unbelievably high levels of abstraction to sort of look for any kind of relevance in the proof from the logical point of view, it's already kind of, you know, the, well, how about the relevance of the methods? Well, one anyway, thing I was, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm um, sorry. No, no, I, I, I was trying to say too much I, in, in, you know, in, in short time. So, but, but, but anyway, but how about, you know, the, the, this was Zach was asking, something is not even provable in PA, you know, how, how does relevance somehow go into the picture? Yeah, so one thing that I think is, I, I hope I think this latches on to what you're saying, and I've, 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 I've never published this, but I've been thinking about it for, I don't know, like 10, 12 years. I've always wanted to think about this in analogy to reverse mathematics, mm -hmm. where wh why, why you as a classical logician should find something like this interesting. I wanted to make this analogy that, look, we have in reverse mathematics, this sort of like, you know, this correspondence between strength of induction and these various mathematical results. And we can say, well, look, these were the necessary conditions to get, I don't know, Koenig's lemma or something. I'm not, I'm not a reverse mathematician, but you know, we, what are the, 
what is the ontological commitment in terms of induction that we have to have? You can do a similar thing. And I think that there's some you know, lesson that you could draw from the failure of this QRF. Like what are the deductive techniques that you would need in order to prove this, mm -hmm. right? Because look, there's a difference in, look, I mean, you notice this when you look at constructive proof. I mean, as a classical logician, I'm a classical logician, I find constructive proofs better, right? Preferable to non-constructive proofs. So I recognize that there's a phenomenological distinction between what the intuitionist says is provable and what the classical mathematician says is provable, right? Why should there not be like a distinction between what you can get with the tools of relevant logic and what you can get when you add more irrelevant, you know, techniques, right? So, I mean, there are distinctions that can be made. And I think it's, I think it's, interesting that's why i don't i don't think it's a crushing blow this friedman result i think it's liberating in some sense because it shows like there are actually interesting questions that can you can look at through this lens right um and yeah i that i don't i don't really have a, I, this, I, the previous question i don't really have a super well formulated answer but I, it's interesting right that you need such and such an axiom of logic to prove this from the piano axioms um, and is there any lesson that you can draw about the types of assumptions you need to make deductively in order to get that and the relationship that holds between them? So yeah, even, in, uh, even if it was unsuccessful, I mean, I, I think it opens, you know, a number of interesting questions. If right, was, so, I don't know. So, so but, but I absolutely agree. That it would be good to see there's the proof of this quadratic reciprocal law step by step to see where non-relevance actually kicks in. Have you, have you tried? No, I have not. Um, I, uh, I, my, my work on this is essentially like editing and stuff and, um, and writing my own thing. So yeah, I, my, my contribution well, to is, is sort this of- a, doing This is a very, editor it's an editorial task really <laughs> to go over the proof. Just get a textbook well, the, and go over the proof. <laughs> yeah, uh, the proof is informally stated. It's look like these are the informal reasons that it would hold. And surely this can be formulated in uh, a mechanical proof in piano arithmetic. Mm -hmm. So I, it's worth, it's worth doing, I think, um, actually giving that mechanical proof. Um, I, ha I haven't done it. I don't know anybody who has, but it's, it's, it's interesting and it's worth doing. So yeah, I, I, correct. Now I've got one more thing that I have to do. Well, can, can I? Uh, these days, maybe some theory of work. So I want to ask uh, um, something completely different, if that's okay. Uh, uh, I'll, uh, basically, I, I'm, I'm interested in, in knowing if there are kind of model theoretic results on what models of relevant arithmetic look like? Because I, I did, you did see, uh, you did show a couple of examples of sort of these finitary uh, models, but I, uh, I'm thinking of things along the lines of like every model of PA has an L, like McDowell Specker, every model of PA has a has an elementary end extension, or things like minimal extensions, or stuff like 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 sort of just model theoretic results about what kinds of uh, you know, uh, about, about how, just what the models of, of relevant arithmetic would, would look like. Yeah, so there's one pragmatic bound on those types of investigations, uh, which is, look, what you saw was, you know, we, we had a deal and we dealt with RM3. And in a lot of the work that uh, uh, Meyer and, and Mortensen did on this, they'd say, okay, well, here's a six valued logic that extends R. And, because the models for R are very, very intentional, right? They have many, a possible world semantics. And I know, I know, I remember talking to you, Roman, about like you gave me a bunch of off prints of work on hiding or models of hiding arithmetic. And when you have that amount of intentionality, it's not clear that you're dealing with the intuitive object of the natural numbers anymore, right? Um, the nice thing about the models of RM3, for example, is that they're they're extensional in a sense, right? And so we can talk about them, you know, pretty, pretty simply in the same way that we talk about models of PA. Um, what I can say is that uh, if we look at those sort of extensions of R, um, 
all those same proof techniques, a lot of those same proof techniques are available to us. So like my, my paper I did for this volume and I was prepared to talk about, but I didn't, right? Um, looked at taking, right? So you, RM, Wush's theorem, right? Holds for RM3, you can take ultra, ultra products and you can construct like, you know, cool models from the finite models. You can take an ultra product, the finite models, you get this infinite model. And um, one of the things I, I did was, you have uh, in some of these models that Meyer Mortensen looked at, they have you have like a you have a Lagrangian uh, Lagrangian uh, you know four square expansion to everything, and so you've got like a four square expansion to like negative one, right? And so like some of the you know like why does this hold? And I think that looking at it through the through ultra products, right? Looking at the elements, like okay, this is why negative one has a four square expansion. So like you can, you can use these things to, I think, reveal kind of interesting features. Um, and all the, you know, as if you look at it from the extensional extensions, like, like RM3, most of those classical proof techniques still sort of hold um, for finitely 